I don't have any limiting beliefs around selling. I don't have any limiting beliefs around meeting new people and going on a date. I don't have any limiting beliefs around making new friends. And in my mind, what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to apply what I understand about social skills to make sales, to make friends, to attract higher quality people. And what I try to show you in these talks is exactly how I'm doing it. So if you feel sort of like a halo effect when you're talking to me, I want you to know how it is that I'm creating that. There's very, very specific things that I am doing that is creating that effect, okay? Now, I wanna show you a little bit about what that's like when you create a proper halo effect. Let me explain to you what it's like. So, and these are kind of bizarre examples, but I wanna really hammer this on you. I will walk down the street, and as I'm walking down the street, people will see me, and they will burst into tears. They will start shaking, and it's very, very common. They burst in tears, they start shaking, and a very, very common response is they pull their wallet out, and they dump the contents of their wallet onto the table, and they start shaking, and they just go, this isn't enough, this isn't enough, and then they just run away. And I'll literally be on a date, and people will come up sometimes several times a night and just dump their wallet onto the table, wow. or just give me their cash, and the person I'm on a date with is like, this is, who are you? This is insane, who are you? Or they start shaking or they start crying. It's a really, really funny thing. And of course, you know, if you're smooth about it, you know, you just pretend like it didn't happen. Like you're just like, oh yeah, anyway. So yeah, but tell me about, like, what's your brother's name? Oh, tell me about that. Like you, make, you don't make it a big deal. You're just like, oh yeah. Right? In your mind, you're like, yes, but you don't show any of that. So that is occurring specifically because I am creating a halo effect. And a lot of what it is that I'm teaching, I'm doing so because back when I was younger, I found my teachers to be very, very boring. And I had a hard time paying attention to what it is that they're saying. And I wouldn't really put a lot of what they're saying into action. So when you create a halo effect, what that's done for, the, the purpose of that is to get people to pedestalize you sufficiently that they will listen to what it is that you're saying. Mm. Now, as much as you can say like, ha ha, now I know it's a halo thing, ha ha ha, didn't trick me. That doesn't matter because I'm doing that to help you to actually take action. So if I'm gonna try to create a three hour video to post online and then get you to watch it and then to get you to go out and do it, see, the reason that you watch my stuff is not because, oh, my stuff is so great. You watch it because I'm able to get you to take action. There's something about the content that I've created where it pulls you in enough to watch it for many hours and then to go out and do it, and then when you go out and do it, you actually get a result. Whereas other teachers may be equally good, you know, I don't actually think so, that's me being fake humble, but we'll pretend. There's other teachers, like for the sake of like the, what we're saying, the other teachers have equally, the other teachers have equally good content, but they can't get you to pay attention sufficiently, okay? So it's just like, you could be meeting somebody who you're very, very attracted to, and you know you could be an amazing partner for them, whether casual or serious. You know that you could, but unless you can actively move them, they are gonna miss out on that experience of getting to know you. They're not gonna see it. So that is basically creating a halo effect, and what it does is it causes people to become very, very reactive to you. They become very reactive in your presence. They become very, very receptive to you leading them, and you know, in a, uh, chemistry and attraction, they tend to become very, very, very attractive, or attracted to you. So you'll see people that are not good looking conventionally, and they can't get a date, and they will drone on and on and on and on and on about how it's their looks, but they have never properly learned how to create a halo effect. Like they don't understand what it means to be talking to somebody and having them literally shaking, they're so attracted to you because you generated that properly. They don't understand what that looks like, and they don't understand how to curate that. Does that mean 100% of people are gonna feel that way about you? Absolutely not. Not only that, but you can get it and lose it. Some, you could have it with someone for a while, and then you lose it. It goes both, it, it kinda cuts both ways. But understand that whether it is me having done over 100 million in sales in my life, whether it's the social success that I teach you, whether it is learning how to be a leader, you, you've got to understand how to create that, okay? So what is it even about the setup that we have here that puts what I'm saying on a pedestal just by this basic little setup that we have right here? Because we're all paying attention to you. You guys flew in for me, you're paying attention to me, you're facing me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So right off the bat, what is that doing to the primitive part of your brain? What's that saying to the primitive part of your brain? He has status. Oh, he has status. Listen to what he's saying. So 
that is one of the first and most obvious things, okay? It's just what's called social proof. Now, you look at me, and I can create social proof via social media. So can you, by the way, but let's just pretend that somehow, some way, you couldn't use social media. Let's pretend that you couldn't for the sake of argument. Well, how can you create social proof in any environment just by spinning it up quickly? What could you do? Being non reactive. Non reactive? Well, that, that's part of it. How can you get social proof? Talking to everybody. Talk to a bunch of people. But here's the things that happen, okay? Could you guys stand up? I'm going to show you something. Stand up. You can even grab the uh, Ronin. No, no. Uh, you guys sit down. Look at that. Case in point. You guys sit down. You guys stand up. Okay, four of you stand up. Okay, so come over here. Okay, so. Um, let's say that I'm talking to you. One of the big things is you've got to understand how to carry the energy of talking to people, right? So what a lot of people do is they will pick one person and they just talk at the one person. So what is happening when they're talking at the one person? What's going on there? They're, what are they doing to that person if they're talking at that one person? What are they doing? They're pedestalizing that person. They're putting them on the pedestal. So there's two different ways that you can create a halo effect. One of them is to be holding court with you talking, but there's actually another one that's more passive. What would that be? It's being the anchor of the conversation and everybody's trying to address you. You're just laying back and you're sort of giving approval or disapproval. You're like, huh, yeah. Now you talk, monkey. Now you talk, dancing monkey. Now you talk, dancing monkey, right? It's like, entertain me. Yeah, entertain me. So it's one of those things where you can get that different you know, people are being a dancing monkey for you, and they're trying to entertain you while you're just laying back. So the point being is, like, they're entertaining you. So say that you got, say that I'm just kind of laying back, and I'm like, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, now your turn. Okay, go ahead. Okay, your turn. Go ahead. And I'm just listening. That's another way to be holding court. Now, the biggest thing that you'll notice is that people will use their voice in a manner where they're not being heard by everybody. So right now, I'm not mic'd. I'm not mic'd right now, but I'm speaking in a way to make sure that every single person here can hear me. And this is gonna cost you millions of dollars, in my personal opinion, is when you can't be heard. So you've got to make sure that you can be heard. Now, being heard comes from interchange, more so than outer technique, but I'll cover that later and you've probably seen other videos. So now, let's say that I'm talking to you guys and I'm just like, you know, engaging. If I just talk only at you, that is now putting you on the pedestal. But if I'm engaging each of you equally, but maybe talking to you a bit more, and then going back and forth, now I'm in the leader position, okay? So have a seat, and let me show you how this would work, okay? So if I want, as I'm public speaking, when I'm going back and forth, notice that I'm making sure that I'm looking at every single person here. I'm kind of going back and forth. Now at one point, I might sort of point at one person and go a little bit like that, and I'll do a bit of that. But even as I'm talking to you, in my mind, I'm still talking to you, I'm still talking to you, I'm still talking to you, I'm still talking to you guys, I'm still talking to them. It's actually one of the reasons why I often get people to pull in closer, because I, I just don't instinctively, like, there could be like this one person like in the corner, and I'm gonna make sure that they can hear me. It's like, I almost can't stop it. So, I'm doing this, but can everybody hear me around? Yeah. How well does everybody hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm doing that, and every single person can hear me. So that is another simple thing that I'm doing, okay? So that's another way to create a halo effect. Now, the other one is the person who cares the most gets the least respect, would be another way of putting it. So the way that I would put it is that if I'm out of my head and I'm unfiltered and I'm just saying what I really think and I'm just letting it come to me, that there will also create a halo effect because it's low status people that need to lie and that need to filter themselves. So the more that you're unfiltered, now keep in mind, this would have been spot on advice about 10 years ago. Now we live in a very, very sensitive world because of social media. People that are of low status have banded together and by collectivizing, they look for wedge issues to have a freaking freak out, okay? So now I can't, you know, you know, back in the day we could say, be yourself and it's gonna work out. It's like, well, I'm not quite sure. I mean, coming from me, look what I've been through, right? <laughs> So, you know, if you want, you know, be careful about getting the kind of results that I've had. So what I would say is learn the gist of how things work and then within that context, be yourself and uh, pray that uh, collectively the planet comes to its senses at some point, okay? 
Because one of the things that I teach my kids is how to not take offense. I literally will sit there with Dylan. I'll be like, Dylan, like, and I'll just, I'll just crap talk him. And I'm like, you don't have to care. Now crap talk me. I don't have to care. Like words don't have to hurt everybody, okay? They don't have to hurt. They really don't. Like we, and, and by the way, the way that the most evil people in the world are able to maintain power is a lot like Star Wars where they have the stormtroopers, okay? They have the stormtroopers. What the most evil people in the world do is they take people that have been the most hurt and then convince them, you've been really, really hurt, get them to collectivize, and then basically exploit them for their agenda. It's the saddest thing in the world. It is so sad, it's so disgusting, and it's, it, I could just talk about this, and honestly, once you get it, you can't unsee it. You really can't unsee it. And that is how um, the most sick, twisted people in the world have like a standing army at their disposal. So we don't need to live in a world where we're sensitive to what people are saying. You can just pretend you didn't hear it. You can just laugh. You can just tease back. You can just set up for yourself and diss them back. Like you don't need to, because what it does, by the way, by making all of this tension around talking, what it does is now they can move what's called the Overton window. Oh no, you can't say this. Now you can't say this. Now you can't say this. Now you can't say that. Next thing you know, the entire world is on house arrest. That only was able to happen because of the tension around being able to talk. So what they do is they, they find a crack, like the founding fathers were like, no crack. Okay, that's called First Amendment, right? And they're like, yeah, but First Amendment, but, First Amendment, but, now you can get your little finger in there and then you can start getting in there and now you can get in there and now you can just put everyone on house arrest for like a year, and you're like, and, and, and everybody knows what nonsense it was, but you can't say it because now it's become normalized that you can't just say whatever it is that you think. That's what happens. So do realize that, okay? So we're in a little bit of a different world now, and just be aware of that dynamic, okay? By the way, it's okay to hate things that people say and not go cry about it. You see what I'm saying? Because see how they mess up that argument? They're like, oh, sorry, you're saying? Is what you're saying is you like all these horrible things that come out of people's mouths? You like it! You support it! Like, no, just because I don't want some psycho to use that as a way to put it, the whole world on a house arrest doesn't mean that I support it, okay? But they're not able to make that, they're not able to make the connection. Even with what I'm saying, that they can't make, they're like, what does that even mean? And they can't see it. It's the craziest thing. Not able to see it. But you literally just got put in jail for a year. You know that, right? You just got put in jail, yo. You just got put in jail, yo. And it's insane. And everybody knew. You guys saw me on the very first day that that happened, cool as a cucumber going, it's going to be fine. It ain't nothing. Relax, guys. You guys remember that video? Yeah, yeah. And, and my whole staff was like, eh, eh, no, it's not going to be fine. Ah, and they're all freaking out. I'm like, God, you guys are so stupid. It's so stupid because I've got friends in all those high places, and they knew what was going on, and everybody, everybody in high places knew what was going on. Everybody knew, guys. Everybody knew. Everybody who was anybody knew. But can't say it. Why? Because we let the cat out of the bag. Okay? You had the wolf by the ears of being allowed to talk. And you're like, but maybe we just shouldn't be allowed to talk. Okay, that's going to be great, right? Yeah. Then I don't want to hear things I don't like. Wrong. Anyway, that's a side point. So let's keep going. That's not going to get fixed in my lifetime. Maybe my kid's lifetime, we could actually be able to talk him. Not going to be fixed in our lifetime. We're going to have to live like this. We let it get to this point. This is where we're at. Way to go. So let's keep going. So going back on halo effect. So other than those things now that you have to be aware of, <laughs> other than that, you basically want to be unfiltered. <laughs> right? I can't even just say be yourself and say what's on your mind anymore. I mean, imagine that. Like, ima imagine that's the world that we live in. But OK. So, so basically what you've got to do is you've got to spend like a day studying everything that you're not allowed to think, OK, because of 1984. Now, once you've figured out everything you're not allowed to think, then the rest of it now you can say. <laughs> so you guys are like, wow, right? But it's true. It's true. So going from that standpoint, be able to be unfiltered, but without like, you know, destroying your career. That's basically how it works. So be able to be unfiltered. Now it's an, it's an ever changing landscape. So be careful about that. Okay. It changes like every five minutes, right? All done with positive intention, of course. So, <laughs> right. They care about you. So coming from that, okay, it is not Satan. So coming from that standpoint, then what you do 
It is not Satan that does that, right? Yeah. Okay. No, no. Of, of, co of course, um, you know, Satan wants to uh, support your constitutional rights, right? Of course, Satan doesn't want to take away your constitutional rights, okay? <laughs> so, okay. So, anyway. So basically, be unfiltered. Sorry to stress you guys out. So it's being unfiltered. So the person who is the most unfiltered, the person who basically just doesn't care, that is always going to be the person with the halo effect because the fact that you're not continually worried about what it is that you're saying, that winds up putting you on a pedestal. So when I come in and I do events, part of the whole guru shtick is the ability to come into this room and just talk without thinking. That is a major, major part. So by the way, Let's think about that as far as attraction now. You're at a bar club, you've got a bunch of social proof. How do you get it? Talk without thinking. So even though I live in a fat crib in the Hollywood Hills, even though I have a 20 year social circle and can do a party at my house anytime that I want. So I never need to go out again, ever. In fact, most people who have the lifestyle that I have, they don't go out to bars, they don't go out to clubs. They, would never need, they wouldn't want to do it. The average party that I would do, the least quality person there would be higher quality than anybody at almost any bar club that I could go to, even a high-end one. So why, would, so why would I want to go out? Because I like practicing these exact skills. I like the skill set component. So what is the skill set that you would do in a social gathering as far as building rapid social proof? How do you build it? What do you think? Energy management. Energy management, yeah. It's a technical way of putting it. Are you an engineer? Uh, what? No. No, what are you? Uh, I'm a server, so I've, I've had experience like managing different social interactions and doing it all at the same time. I see it. I can definitely see it. So what would you guys say is, um, how do you gain social proof quickly? Approach everyone. Oh, open all. Giving value. Tell stories. Yeah, it's like be unfiltered. Just start talking and having fun. So compare one person who is hyper-analyzing every single thing that it is that they're saying. And you know somebody's on the low end of the totem pole when they come to you and they go, I just don't know what to say. I just don't know what I would say. I run out of things to say. Why do you think you're running out of things to say? Because in your mind, you're the low person on the totem pole. In your mind, nothing that you say is good enough. And in your mind, you are dumb enough, dumb and naive enough to believe that a series of magical words is going to unlock someone's interest to get to know you better. Like, well, what are the things that you say? Like, how do I keep being this person who's stifled, whose voice doesn't carry, who has no social proof, and who sucks? And then you tell me a little script, and then with my little script, all those problems are wiped away. They're all wiped away. And then I live, ha I, I find my soulmate, and we run off and live happily ever after. I'm like, okay, here's the words. <laughs> Today I woke up, and I saw a rainbow, and on a rainbow was an elf. And from the elf, the elf had a, had a pot of gold. And you, baby, are my pot of gold. <laughs> That's what you'd say, right? Like, as if there's something like that. Like, there's this thing like that. You're like, today I woke up, and, and I was thinking about a tiger. And the tiger could chase me. And I see that tiger, I go, oh, you naughty little tiger. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to chase you. And I am going to chase you. <laughs> yeah. Right. By the way, that would actually work. <laughs> yeah, that would actually work because it's so stupid. Right? So, it, it, it's, yeah, almost anything imitating something stupid is funny. So coming from that standpoint, it, there, there, there's no, nothing like that exists. It does not exist. Nothing like that exists. I know the people who say things like that exist. I hang out with them. Nothing like that exists. Now, here is where it does exist to an extent. Here's what it is. You want to think of everything within a paradigm. So some people, the paradigm that they're in is they are just absolutely determined to stay in this stifled, dark headspace. And so from that stifled, dark headspace, they don't want to leave it. They're addicted to it, like crackheads. They want to stay in it. So now they're like, how do I get to keep being, like what you're saying to me is I'd have to become present to the moment. I'd have to get out of my head. Things would have to go awesome. And I can't do that. So instead, 
I want you to tell me what to say. And then when you tell me what to say, because the guru said it, I will believe in what it is that you told me to say. And so let's say, for example, like who here, who here can think of like a dumb story? Anyone here have a dumb story? I'll show, I'll show you how this works. Okay, here, stand up. Okay, give me like a 20 second random story and then I'll show you. So he's now the guru. He's the social guru. Okay, now he's gonna give me the line. So give me like a, like a 20 second line that I'm gonna repeat. Humpty Dumpty stood on a wall. Humpty Dumpty fucked a troll. Humpty Dumpty came into this room. Humpty Dumpty humped me with a broom. Okay, all right, have a seat. Okay, all right. So Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Humpty Dumpty at something or other. Humpty Dumpty fell on the floor and Humpty Dumpty did this. Yeah. So I could repeat what it is that he's saying. I could do what he's saying. And for somebody who's not used to it, here's what they would do. They'd go, like normally the way they talk, they'd be like, hey, like, how's it going, right? And they won't engage the whole group. <laughs> you know, they're kind of like that. And then, and then they hear your thing and they go, wait, that's the line. Then because they believe in the line that you told them, they're like, hey, my name's Owen. Oh, see, it never works without the line. I, I tried it without the line a gazillion times. It just never, ever works. I hate this. It doesn't work. I'm so mad. It, 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 like, come on. Like, you know, repeated results replies techniques, or, or replies te it requires a technique with repeated testing so I could get a predictable result. So tell me what to say. And you tell me the Humpty Dumpty thing. Now, all of a sudden, I believe in it. I'm like, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Humpty Dumpty was up on the wall. Humpty Dumpty <laughs> made me feel not so small. Humpty Dumpty, he's got big balls. And he does, now he does that, and then what's gonna start happening is he's gonna believe in it, and then he's gonna go, look at that. But then he runs out of the Humpty Dumpty thing. So he goes, anyway, uh, yeah. Mm. Uh. Okay. Right? Yeah. I think it was my looks, because I didn't have the right lines that caused this. Like, like, they're super weird. They're crazy freaking weird. And not like in a fun way, just like in a, like the not good weird way. Not like Napoleon Dynamite weird and is cool. <laughs> like the not cool one. And what happens is then they blame it on their appearance. They blame it on not having the right line, et cetera, et cetera, because they believe they're at the effect. The idea that they could be in control of things and actually have influence, that would kind of get rid of the victim complex so it messes them up. So a big thing is, again, social proof. How do we get social proof? You get out of your head and you're able to speak freely, you know, within certain boundaries that we talked about here in the world that we live in. I can't believe I even have to say that. But anyway, largely freely. We're still, you know, I'd almost say that like our freedom of speech at this point is like parallel to our like general freedom. You know what I mean? It's like we still have freedom, like kind of. <laughs> we still can talk, kind of. So that's kind of where we're at. But within the kind of, then what you have is you could talk. So going from that standpoint, You've got to be able to be unfiltered. How do we do this? I mean, a lot of it is inner shifts, isn't it? So a lot of it is, let me give you some examples. One of it would be believe that what you have to say has value just because your unique perspective is different from anybody else's perspective. That would be one thing. Another one is lower the bar of how good it has to be for you to have fun with what it is that you're saying. That, that lower the bar one is so like, undervalued, but it's massive. Lower the bar, please lower the bar. I do a lot of exercise where I'll get you to describe something boring and do so with good tonality and with conviction and make it fun and make it funny. And if you could do that, that is the power to be able to talk and talk. That's another one. Another one is find more things that are funny in the world. Like just as a part of your day-to-day -day life, find more about the world that is funny. Think about humor as your emotional immune system. That's really what humor is, isn't it? Humor is your ability to process trauma. That is also why all these wackos love to go after humor. Why do you think all these wackos love to attack humor? Because the whole point of humor is to take something that is horrifying and bad, make fun of it so that we can release the tension around it. But the people that don't want to allow comedy are people, they don't want the tension to be released. They want the tension to stay there, they want it to fester, and they want it to explode. So they, they want everybody walking on eggshells so that everything will just blow up. Regardless of that, 
use humor as your emotional immune system. So whenever you see somebody under stress, you can see the degree to which they have an emotional immune system by their ability to make stressful situations funny. Does that mean you don't take action? Does that mean that you just sit there laughing at the problem and then let it get worse? No. What it means though is that you can laugh about it, recenter yourself, and then use that as the foundation from which to act to fix a problem. So you'll see me laughing at almost everything, but then I go fix it. So yeah, some people they just try to fix it, but they're so stressed, they make it worse. Other people they laugh at it, then they don't fix it. You want to be using both. So have a general view of life that makes things funny and cultivate that outside of social interactions. Let me give you another tip. If you're out with your buddy, the vibe that you create with the two of you is so much more important than what it is that you say when you go into a social interaction. If you and your buddy are cracking jokes and laughing and having good vibes and having fun, that makes you automatically attractive and that makes people want to jump into your interaction. So make sure that you and your buddy are having a lot of fun together. Don't just be like a marionette where you're like, and then you see somebody you want to talk to and you're like, Wing! and then you jump up. Because <laughs> what that is, that's a lot of people that are in a very dark headspace and they want someone to come and soothe them. And so they're like, well, I feel like garbage, but if somebody could love me, then I'd feel better. So what they wind up doing is they um, walk through life like this in a very like kind of like this sort of uh, low state. And then because they want to take something from someone, whether that's physical intimacy or validation or friendship or whatever, now they perk up and then they'll be at their best. Why, you know why you get nervous to go meet somebody? Because you're in a low mood, then you fake being in a better mood and then you feel like a fake. If you actually were in a good mood consistently and having fun consistently, all you do is just turn your body and start talking to the new person the same way that you're talking to your friend. So understand, so much of the old school social skills community was centered around how do you stay in a low state, how do you not learn how to think for yourself, how do you not believe in yourself, but then just find a way to stay like that and then have a magic line to let you stay like that and get a result. What I'm saying is let that weak part of yourself die. So now you're in a venue and you've gone and you're building social proof and you're talking freely. Here would be another thing. How are you interpreting interactions that are not what you had hoped. A thousand out of ten. A thousand out of ten. Who would have the courage to do that? Why? You view things as positive even if it didn't go well. So you find something funny about it. Now, you want to hear something crazy? This is a crazy thing. So whenever I do teaching and I take somebody out and help them to work on their social skills, I will say after every single interaction, I want you to say thousand out of ten. And then I want you to tell me something funny about it. And I'll literally say, I'm going to trick you when we're out, I'm gonna trick you. So I'm gonna say, how was that? And then you're gonna say, well, you know, they liked me or they didn't like me or it was okay or it wasn't okay. And I'm gonna trick you because what I want you to say is thousand out of 10. And I'm gonna trick you over and over and over and over and over the whole weekend. You're gonna get tricked. And I, now, even now as you're hearing this, you're thinking, no, no, I wouldn't get tricked. Like those, th those are the dumb people I'm not going to get tricked. That, that's almost like thinking you're not going to eat the bread on the table if you're on a diet, if you leave the bread there, right? You swore you're going to eat, not eat the bread. Next thing you know, you've eaten the whole freaking bread. It's almost like if you say you won't eat it, you'll like binge it. Right? Like, like at a certain point, you ate so much bread, you're like, I'm just a bad little boy. I'm a bad little boy. And you just shove it down your face. You're like rubbing it on your face. Is that just me? I've, I've actually like legit done that. <laughs> so <laughs> I learned when I was cutting just like, just get that bread off the table. Because you're like, I'll just have a little bite. Then you're like, another little bite. And then you're just like, Rah! You're like rolling it on the ground. So, am I the only one that did that? I don't know, okay. <laughs> so anyway, you, you, you get me. You understand. I was eating carnivore diet for like six months. Yeah. So strict. Yeah. I was in Miami here, and it was such a great vacation, and they brought fries over. I said, I won't only want steak. Yeah. Steak. Yeah. Don't bring the fries. Yeah. They brought the fries. Yeah. And he's like, everything okay? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I was looking at it. I was eating it. And then I, I was like, maybe I'll lick it. Uh, I tried one fry. Yeah. Five seconds later, I had the whole <laughs> plate. And I was just like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What happened? Uh, what happened? And it was over. You I snapped. Next day, heroin. I'm like, ah. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. 
By the way, you can see he's done some work on this, right? So do you see how he makes that story interesting? Right? Some people call it like, like the fries routine. But you see the idea of what he's doing there, right? Like, like me in my role as teacher, like I could like literally have millions of people running through the streets doing the fries routine now. Like I could actually do that. Like this is what Owen says when he goes out, right? You want to meet people like this? The fries routine. Like I could do that as like a troll, you know, like as a troll just to do something crazy. And we can make it even dumber than that. And we could literally do it. So. It's when you believe in what it is that you're saying, and that, th that self-belief that you have winds up pulling people into the story that it is that you're telling. So me up here as a teacher, in order to captivate you for many hours, we're going to be here for several days, right? I've got to believe that what I'm saying is so awesome and so urgent and so epic that everything out of my mouth, you're like, oh, thank you, Owen. Oh. <laughs> That was so amazing, right? But really what it is that you're feeling is how awesome I think it is. And then if I think it's awesome, then you'll think it's awesome. And then ideally you'll go take action on it because you think it's awesome and then it'll change your life. That's how a good teacher is effectively working. Now that same principle also goes for what you rate yourself. So if in your mind you're a nine or a 10, other people will feel that way about you. And this is one of the most difficult to understand and kind of weird ideas that you'll learn in social skills. Because the problem is, you take somebody who believes they're a two, and you're like, well, guess what, little buddy? Now is your big day. Because what do you now believe yourself in, little buddy? And they're like, I am a 10. And they don't believe it. So it doesn't really make the change. In fact, it makes them worse. Because now you have somebody who thinks he's a two, trying to act like he thinks he's a 10. And then it comes across as what's called incongruent. But if in your mind, it is completely, utterly normal for you, like as an example, to close a very, very high ticket client. Like I remember I started, I've always done high ticket one-on-ones. But when COVID hit, I mean, we ran a company about social skills in seminar rooms and bars. Can you imagine what it was like trying to run a business and that's your company? When that happened, when, when, the, when the pandemic <laughs> hit, then I remember like, um, I instantly burned through all my savings, tried to keep my staff paid, and then I instantly went about $900,000 in debt. No money, and close to a million in debt. But you didn't see me crying about it, I just, I literally, I had a video, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be fine, guys, anyway. In my mind, I'm like, it's a lot of debt. <laughs> but what are you going to do? <laughs> I don't know, right? I didn't really know. So the point being, right, but people would have the nerve to say to me, like, like I saw in the comments, people like, oh, from your Hollywood Hills mansion, like, rich people like you are insulated from this. Like, I have staff. I have mouths to feed. Like, do you think that I'm part of, like, the liberal elite establishment and that I have, like, venture capital that's just funding me up? to do my seminars company. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a blue collar work ethic kind of person that just has all these staff with kids that I want to see them paid. So what I did was I started doing a ton of one-on-one -on -one coaching. And what I found was there was a whole bunch of people that are some of the richest people in the world that love what it is that we do. And I just got them to pay all my bills. And it was very, very easy to do. So I call them on the phone and they say, how much is it? And I remember the first time that I asked for 25K for an hour. And in my mind, I was like, I can't believe I'm going to ask. And now I'm just like, this is stupid. It's not even enough. But at the time, I'm like, going to ask for 25K. I'm like, well, <coughs> 25K. <laughs> you know, right? I remember saying that. And I, was, and, and I had to go into my mind and make that normal. That has to be normal. Just like a luxury good shop has to be able to say, that's normal that you pay for that, right? Like this watch is maybe, I don't know, 20,000-ish. That has to be normal to be like, how much for that watch? Oh, 20K. And like the person at the Rolex store has to be able to say that like it's normal. Totally, totally, utterly normal. They've got to look you in the eye, like Timex watch, $39. Old watch, not as good as the Timex, $200,000 for a lot of these things. 
million dollars for a lot of these things. And they've got to be able to look at you in the eye and it's like, this is a watch for rich people. So the challenge is on you of whether or not you're good enough to buy this. This is not a us problem. This is kind of a you problem. Maybe you should get your stuff together and come back when you're ready, small fry. That's the general mindset that a, that a fancy jewelry store has. Go to Tom Ford. and Go do this. Go to Tom Ford, try on the jacks. Average jacket at Tom Ford, 5,800, 10,000 for like a leather jacket. And you say, how much is the jacket? Oh, it's 10K. It's completely normal. That's a normal thing. So in your mind, you've got to understand where you value yourself and what you can congruently say. So if in your mind you're like, the people who I date are this kind of a person, that becomes norm when that becomes normalized to you, then if you view yourself as a 10, the challenge is not whether or not you're good enough for them, the challenge is whether or not they're good enough for you. And that shifts the buyer-seller dynamic through a lot of subtle social cues. There's all these little subtle social cues that are happening. And does that mean that every single person buys in? No, absolutely not. But some people do. Not everybody goes and buys an AP or a Patek Philippe or a Rolex watch. Not everybody does. But there's enough people who do that they don't care. So you've got to ask yourself, where do I price myself at? What do I view myself as far as my value? And a lot of it just comes from how quickly you flinch. And a lot of it is the, is like the, um, like I don't give a crap vibe. Like the no Fs given vibe. There's a certain vibe shift that occurs when you really don't need it, isn't there? You ever notice that? Yeah. There's a vibe shift that occurs when you really don't need it. For example, you guys saw Marcel up here earlier, right? So Marcel was kind of bragging a little bit. Oh, I have a lot of million dollar year clients. Do you guys know that Marcel doesn't want those clients and that's not BS? He doesn't want those clients. Every time Marcel takes another million dollar client, he's actually upset when he, he comes and sees me and he's like upset at dinner and he's like, I, I shouldn't have taken it. Why do you think that is? Because he wants more. Marcel's really, really good with cold traffic. He runs, he's not like a organic so social media guy so much. He does some, but not much. He's very, very, very good at cold traffic. Every time that he takes on a million dollar a year client, let's say he's doing a call a week with him, right? Now that's a million dollars for 52 hours work. So that's one person's average work day. But is it really just the hour? No, because that client is always on your mind. You're always thinking of them. You know, really what they're doing when they, when they do a one-on-one -on -one with you is they're purchasing like 20% of your brain. It's not really an hour, is it? Because yeah, it's an hour deliverable, but it's like a big chunk of your brain all week, you know, dreaming about it, thinking about it, processing it. That's really what they're, like, for example, this event here, is this really a three-day deliverable? No, no. Not even close. How much promotion, time, logistics, vocal wear and tear, getting all swollen up. This is really about a one-month deliverable that you guys will consume in a day period or something like that. Because I've got to prepare to leave, then I run it. Then when I get home, I'm exhausted because I'm going to give everything that I have at this thing. There's also all the opportunity costs of, like, remember, every time that I say, come the event, come the event, come the event, come the event, come the event. Like, how many times do you guys hear me say to come to this, this event? Hundreds. Hundreds of times, right? That could have been buy the digital, 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 buy the digital. That sounds quite congruent, doesn't it? Does it make you want to buy the digital? <laughs> yeah. Okay, buy the digital, <laughs> buy the digital. Okay. So, Right? So, so now, those digitals also do millions of bucks a year too. So that's, that's a burned CTA. That's a burned call to action to get people to come to an event. So, you know, there's ways that I can make that work, and I do. But I'm not complaining, maybe a touch. But what I'm saying is that um, the deliverable is not the same thing. So Marcel knows. He's like, well, yeah, you know, it's an hour a week, but that's, not, that's, just, the, that's just the deliverable. But, like, it's a chunk of my brain. And he knows he can make more money doing other things. That's why... Now, please understand this. That's why he gets a million dollar year clients. Mm. He gets a million dollar year clients because he doesn't want them. He doesn't want them. Marcel doesn't want them. That's why he can get them. Marcel just broke up with a girl that I would say is a 10, looks, personality, no jealousy whatsoever, 
brings her friends in the mix quite frequently and, and dotes on him. And all he could talk about, in the same way that he's always trying to get out of his million dollar year clients, he's like, I shouldn't have agreed to this. All he can think about is how he wants to get out of his relationship. That's why he can get a relationship like that. See, understand, every one of you in this room, I would bet, I, I would suspect every single one of you, like, all of you would be like, that's how he treated you? But I wouldn't. I would love you. I would just love you. And her response would be like, <laughs> right? They don't want that. They don't want that. Okay? You know, any of you guys, you're like, a, a million dollars for 50 hours of work? I would love you. <laughs> I'll do it. I would love you. That's why you can't get it. That's why you can't get it. So it's when you hit a point where you have not faked indifference, but real indifference, where like you really don't want it. Like you just, you don't want it. Every girl that I've ever been with, and I'm not saying this to be like, I love every ex-girlfriend I've ever had. Like I would do, go to the end of the earth with them. I love them to death. But at one point or other, and by one point or other, I mean nonstop the whole time, wanting to get married. Now, to be fair, a lot of time when they eventually dumped me, I have had low moments when they eventually got sick of me and left me, and I was like, please come back, okay? So I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But nonetheless, during the course of the relationship, begged me to get married. But understand, like, any one of you, if you knew any of my ex-girlfriends, would be like, I'll marry you. You don't need to, like, cry for hundreds of hours. I'll do it. <laughs> That's why they won't do it. Okay? That's why they won't. So understand, it's, it's, the, it's the no Fs given mindset. Because why would Marcel, like literally, he's like, how do I get rid of this perfect 10 goddess who loves me and dedicates her life to me? How do I get that to end? Why does he want to do that? Because he's like, I'm 24. I've got, I'm, I'm like, I've got crazy social skills, like ridiculous. I live in a 30K a month mansion. I got five, six luxury cars. I travel, I fly private. Like, why do I, why do I want to have a girlfriend? That's what he's thinking. It doesn't matter what, you know, what he is. Now, he had that same reaction when he's broke, by the way. But I just want to show you his current mindset. He's, had, he's been doing that since he was poor, because I'd known him since he's poor, and we were going out. So same, same difference. I know, I know some of you guys can't handle that, right? Like, it's like once you hear that a guy, like, had skills before he's rich, but then now he has skills when he's rich. You're like, I just knew it was gonna have to get rich, right? You can't, you just get stuck on it, right? When Marcel was 19, we'd go out and he was tearing it up. So, okay, I'm only gonna go out with somebody who's tearing it up. So I, if I'm gonna go out with somebody, it's gotta be fun. So, but in his mind, he's like, why would I have built all this for that? Why would I do that? That's how he's seeing it. So, it's the ability, it's that, it's that, it, and there's subtle, subtle vibe shifts that happen. It's in the eye contact. It, it, it's in little moments when you push the person away, but you didn't even mean to, right? It's in that moment where you're talking and then you just get distracted and you kind of just go talk and you're like, oh, hey. Like most times that I've met someone really spectacular and we ran off together for the, for the night, it wasn't like, come on, come on, right? It wasn't like that. It was like, oh, ha, ha. talking to my friends. Oh, uh, hey, we're going. <laughs> it's more like that. And the weird thing is in my mind, it's real. It's always real to the next morning. Then I wake up and I'm like, amazing. Like, I, I don't even realize it. <laughs> like, it's like I come out of a trance. It's like a weird thing. I come out of a trance. Um, and frankly, it's the same thing over the years. Like, I find when I'm at different junctions where a transaction can happen, whether it's like, you know, selling, whether it's uh, public speaking, whether it's like meeting someone who you're really, really into. You ever seen that thing in basketball where they go ice in my veins like that? I don't know why, but I become the most calm. I just become inc weirdly, freakishly calm when I have pressure. Like, when something could really help my life, 
I find I go in this like, like it's so zen. Sometimes I'll be like, like I'm so present that like, I'm like, I can't even have a thought. Like my brain won't even let me out. And I'm like, I just have this like awareness. Like I can't even think. I'm like, I am Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> I'm an animal. Like I'm not even a human. You know, like my mind, like my brain under pressure, my brain won't even allow me to think in many cases. In the areas where I'm good, areas where I'm not good, I'm freaking out, right? If I went like uh, wingsuiting, I'd be like, ah, you know, I'd be freaking out. But in areas that I'm experienced. And you want to know why that is? To tell you the truth. You want to know the big reason why that is? Because I went out so many times and I thought, and it didn't help anything. I just realized like trying harder doesn't work. Sometimes you need to try harder like a thousand times and you just realize, like, this doesn't help anything, right? It's like, you know they say if you punch at the wall, you'll break your hand, but if you just punch through it, it's, you wouldn't break your hand? Is that true? I don't even know. Well, anyway, at a certain point when you broke your hand on the wall a bunch of times, you're like, this isn't safe. This just hurts my hand. Like, I don't like this. So you just punch through it. You're like, I don't want to hurt my hand anymore. And you just punch through it. That happens when under pressure, when, you, when, when succumbing to pressure by overthinking, you'll realize like this isn't really helping me at all. It's actually making things worse. So you just learn to stop thinking. So it's that ability to view yourself as a 10, view what you have to say as amazing, use that to generate social proof, and then in your mind, only other very, very high level people have any chance to go any deeper with you. And you just feel that in your bones.